Professor Dave here. Let's look at improper integrals. He knows a lot about all kinds of stuff. Professor Dave explains. In learning about integration, we've been focusing largely on indefinite integrals. This is because these focus on the act of finding the antiderivative, which is the bulk of the task. When we want to evaluate them within some limits of integration, like with the definite integrals we looked at, it's just a little bit of algebra. We evaluate the antiderivative at the upper limit, then the lower limit, and subtract the latter from the former. That gives us a number that represents the area under the curve within that finite interval. But sometimes we will want to evaluate an integral over an interval that is infinitely large. This will happen when one of the limits of integration is either positive or negative infinity, or if the function has an infinite discontinuity within the finite interval of a to b. When this is the case, we call these improper integrals. Let's learn about these now. Now, one might initially assume that if the interval is infinite, the area under the curve must also be infinite. But actually, this is not always the case. We've seen countless times by now that calculus is all about doing something infinitely many times and getting a finite result, kind of like the infinite series that sums to give e. So we can indeed have a function that extends infinitely in a particular direction and yet spans a finite area. Take for example the curve 1 over x squared. Let's say we want to integrate this starting at x equals 1 and going to infinity. To examine what happens as we get closer to infinity, let's select an arbitrary upper limit of integration and call it t. We can treat this like a definite integral and get the antiderivative. x to the negative 2 will give us x to the negative 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1 over x. Let's evaluate this over our selected interval, and we get negative 1 over t minus negative 1 over 1. These two negative signs cancel to give us positive 1, and switching the order, we can express this as 1 minus 1 over t. So if we take t to equal 2, we get 1 minus 1 half, which is 1 half. If we take t to equal 10, we get 1 minus 1 tenth, or 9 tenths. We can plug in larger and larger values for t, and we get closer and closer to 1. And if we plug in infinity for t, which means integrating over this whole portion of the function all the way to infinity, then we get 1 as the answer. That means, quite incredibly, that the area under the curve from x equals 1 all the way to infinity is 1. This gives us a simple way to evaluate improper integrals. We can integrate f of x dx from a to infinity, and this will simply be equal to the integral over the definite interval from a to t in the limit of t approaching infinity. This limit may or may not exist, which means that not all improper integrals can be evaluated, but some indeed can. This also works in the negative direction. If we are integrating from negative infinity to b, we just integrate from t to b and see what happens in the limit of t approaching negative infinity. If we are evaluating an improper integral and we do get a finite number as an answer, then we say that the interval is convergent. If the limit does not exist, meaning the area truly is infinite, we say that the interval is divergent. Unfortunately, it may be difficult to tell whether an integral is convergent or divergent just by looking at it. Say we try to do the same thing with 1 over x. We can integrate this function from 1 to infinity by replacing infinity with t. The integral of 1 over x is the natural log of x, so when we evaluate, we get the natural log of t minus the natural log of 1. The natural log of 1, or any log of 1, must be 0, because anything to the 0 power gives us 1. So that term goes away, leaving us with the natural log of t. 
as t gets larger, this term gets larger, and it does so without bound, all the way to infinity. So this one didn't work out as nicely as the first one, and this integral is indeed divergent, even though the two functions look fairly similar. From this, we conclude that 1 over x squared gets small enough, fast enough, that the area under the curve is finite, while 1 over x also gets small enough as it too goes to zero as x approaches infinity. It just doesn't do it fast enough, and we needed calculus to tell us this fact. Let's try another one. How about 1 over the quantity 1 plus x squared? This function looks like this, extending to positive and negative infinity in either direction. And it's perfectly symmetrical, so let's just pick one half. How about from zero to positive infinity? So as we know, we change infinity to t, and we integrate. If we consult our table of common integrals, this is actually a special one, as it fits the form of 1 over x squared plus a squared, and in this case, a equals 1, so we get inverse tangent of x. We will then evaluate this at t, and then 0, and we get inverse tangent of t minus inverse tangent of 0. We can evaluate the inverse tangent of 0 quite easily. It is simply the angle that gives us a tangent value of 0. As tangent is sine over cosine, when sine is 0, we get 0 overall, and sine is 0 at 0. So inverse tangent of 0 is 0. That leaves us with the inverse tangent of t, which we must now examine as t approaches infinity. For an inverse tangent to be getting larger, it must mean that the sine value is increasing, while the cosine value is decreasing, because a larger and larger number being divided by a smaller and smaller number must be approaching infinity. Moving through quadrant 1, the tangent value approaches infinity until we get to half pi, where it is undefined. That means that the inverse tangent of infinity is half pi. So the area under this half of the curve is half pi. To get the other half, we could do the exact same thing, but integrate from t to 0, and we would again get half pi which makes sense, as this is perfectly symmetrical, and half pi plus half pi is pi. So the area under this entire curve, which spans from negative infinity to positive infinity, is actually a finite number, pi. And this integral, no matter what the interval, is indeed convergent. Apart from being impressed that this integral from negative infinity to positive infinity yields a finite number, we might also be quite astonished that this number is pi. We are used to seeing pi when dealing with circles, and here there is no circle to be found, just another example of the stunning beauty and mystery that can be found in mathematics. So integrating over an infinite interval is one way we can get an improper integral. There is another way that involves finite intervals, and this will be when there is some vertical asymptote within the interval. This allows the curve to extend to infinity, not in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical direction. And we might not be too surprised by now to find out that this circumstance can also yield a convergent integral with a finite value. To evaluate these, it's not much different. It's just that instead of replacing infinity with t, we replace either one of the limits of integration, if one of the limits is the asymptote, or we replace some value in between with t, if the asymptote is in the middle of the interval. Let's take the function 1 over root x minus 2 and integrate from 2 to 5. This function has a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, so we can see that this will be an improper integral. So instead of integrating from 2, we have to integrate from t, and then look at what happens to the integral as t approaches 2 from the positive direction. To integrate, let's just use a simple substitution, changing x minus 2 into u. That means that du will be equal to dx, and we have u to the negative 1 half du. Integrating will give us u to the positive 1 half over 1 half, or 2 root u. We then change u back, and we have 2 root x minus 2. Let's evaluate this at 5 and t. For 5, we get 2 root 3, and for t, 
we get 2 root t minus 2. As t approaches 2 from the positive direction, what's inside this radical remains positive but gets closer and closer to 0. And in the limit of t approaching 2, this term will become 0. So the answer is 2 root 3 for the area under the curve for this interval. And the integral is therefore convergent. So we can see that evaluating improper integrals is not that much different than evaluating regular definite integrals. In fact, it's exactly the same. It's just that we see what happens when one of the limits of integration starts moving towards some particular value, whether positive or negative infinity or some vertical asymptote. It is very important to recognize when an integral is improper because we must evaluate it accordingly. Evaluating an improper integral as though it is a definite integral, simply evaluating the antiderivative at the limits of integration and subtracting, can indeed yield incorrect values. So as you go about integrating, if something looks like it might have an asymptote of some kind, check the graph of the function being integrated over the specified interval to see if you need to adjust your approach accordingly. With that understood, let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.